director of the University Sao Paulo's Research Center on Public Policy. She was the Brazilian Minister of Education's General Coordinator for Policies Supporting Higher Education Internationalization. She's the editor for Latin America in the Springer's Encyclopedia of International Higher Education Systems and Institutions. And Professor Hans de Witt, he is a distinguished fellow, emeritus professor and past director of the Center of International Higher Education at Boston College in the United States. He's a senior fellow of the International Association of Universities, and he received the Noam Chomsky North Star Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society of Transnational Academic Scholars. Each of our speakers have got a much longer bio um, and it's, you know, it's very hard to condense it and I hope I have done justice to you um, and your achievements over the years. So for now, let me start. I want to start with Jonathan and then go to Elizabeth and ask you, Professor Johnson, if you can share with us, what do you think? What is student success? Thank you very much. Um, look, in the in the first instance for me, and particularly in the South African context, uh, given the very high, uh, first of all, the very low numbers of students who get into university uh, compared to other uh, countries, and the very small numbers that succeed in the first year and proceed to, to, to graduate within four to six years. So for me, student success has to be uh, in the first instance, academic success. In other words, you've got to be able to pass and pass well enough in the um, uh, the causes that constitute the subject and the degree. If we miss that simple and perhaps too obvious uh, 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 point, then of course uh, the system collapses. Now, universities unfortunately have had many different ways of dealing with this, partly because our subsidy a formula has a way of, you know, encouraging negative um, behavior so that people take shortcuts. But that's another debate. For now, just academic success is the most important. The second thing is personal transformation. Again, a country scarred by, you know, racism, uh, uh, sexism, xenophobia, and all of that stuff. You have to extend the meaning of success beyond the traditional metrics, such as uh, uh, academic performance. And so I would like to see my own university where I am at the moment, as you know, is in a hole as a result of uh, institutional racism. I think uh, the personal transformation of, you know, 30,000 odd students has to be part of the way in which we measure success. And thirdly, um, I do believe we should never forget as universities that a very big part of what we do is leadership uh, preparation. And so I would like to, to believe that that becomes a very important part of what constitutes success, not simply, you know, churning out thousands of graduates every year, but knowing with some degree of confidence that those students will lead, whether it's in the NGO sector, whether it's in you know, government, whether it's in business, uh, uh, whether it's internationally, but that they are not only invested in themselves as individuals, uh, but also in a leadership in a very really broken country and continent, and indeed in the world. Thank you, um, Jonathan. Elizabeth, do you want to share what your idea of success is? And then I want to interrogate it slightly. Well, I think that Professor Jonathan uh, sum up the main important traits of a student success at the university. I think, yes, academic success, meaning expanding your knowledge, your abilities to learn, to use what you learn in practical, in the practical world. These are very important. I think it's the core mission of the university. When university teach the students, they teach skills, they teach competencies uh, that will be important for, for, the, for the students across uh, his or her life. Uh, 
I think also changing the way the people see the world, is, it's very important. Here in Brazil, I think this is a key issue for at least for the public universities. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows that, but in Brazil, the public universities are tuition free, uh, but they are also uh, highly uh, research focused and they are at the top of the, let's say, higher education hierarchies in Brazil. So for a long time in Brazil, because we, we, we didn't have any kind of, let's say, segregation policy in Brazil. On the contrary, Brazil always was a country where the law forbid any kind of segregation. But we have, we have in Brazil, uh, uh, it's what we call nowadays structural um, structural racism in the in the sense that if because of our heritage of slavery and all the problems we have in our in our country, of course, uh, uh, the elite in Brazil is a white one, and in the past it was the white the children from white families that entry into these well regarded. Uh, universities. Nowadays, we have a very important, a very impress, impressive uh, uh, affirmative action policies in Brazil. Half of our entrance positions are reserved for students from lower income families, from black, from indigenous, and things like that, and people from different minorities in Brazil. This made a very important transformation in Brazil. And I think that it opened our, our perception of how ingrained it is in Brazil, racism and the problems related to inequality. So I think that one of, of the most important measures of success, uh, of student success is the way he or she change the way they see the world. And also for the university, I think that we have a very important role as an institution, which is nowadays to change the composition of our elites. We need a more diverse elite, economic and also political elite in the sense that we could recognize and be aware of the problems, of the many problems that different countries, different parts of the country faces. Brazil is a very large country. We have a lot of differences from one part of the world to another part of the country. Yeah. For instance, we have snow at the south and equatorial uh, um, warm in the north. So yeah. it's a very, very interesting country. Elizabeth, we'll come back to that in a minute because I, um, I hear you say that there have been some failures of universities that we now see in Brazil. Look, we see them all over South Africa too. So I just want to normalize that. But um, we'll come to that point in the third question. But I want to just welcome Hans and ask Hans, can I ask you that question too? If you were to, or tell us, with all the debates about student success, what for you, what would you define as a core ingredient in student success? Well, thank you, and uh, pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. Of course, I think it's very important that we uh, have a good discussion about uh, what we mean with student success. Uh, student success has always been by the academic institutions perceived as they have to graduate. Uh, and uh, from the labor market perspective, they have to get a good job, uh, a career perspective. But I think there are much more important aspects that we have been underestimating in our discussion about student success, and that's that they have to be also good citizens, that they have to uh, be prepared to uh, live in a society uh, which is much more inclusive and uh, which is much more diverse, has been uh, uh, addressed by Elizabeth as well uh, uh, for the Brazilian context. Uh, we have been ignoring the fact that we as academic institutions have a social responsibility, our third mission in higher education. And that applies also, in my view, to uh, the discussion about student success, that uh, we have to prepare 
students better for a society which is much more inclusive and diverse. And uh, uh, that's a problem that we have in the global north, but that's also what we see in Latin America, what you see in South Africa. And uh, uh, if we don't do that, then people don't understand the complexity of the context. Uh, in that sense, also, I was very much impressed by uh, Jonathan's uh, uh, talk about uh, the imp uh, importance of looking at inclusion also in the complex way of Africa and South Africa, uh, that uh, we cannot ex exclude people because they are from a different culture or a different language of a different country. Uh, we have to be inclusive and uh, making student success much more in that direction is more needed than ever for reasons of the sustainable development goals uh, that we have to apply. So if we only prepare students uh, that they become uh, good professionals with a big career and getting rich, et cetera, that would be a very elitist and a wrong approach to student success. I think we have to emphasize much more the social role uh, of students and that by also how we define as institutions of higher education and student success. Mm. Thank you, Hansa. I think we have an agreement that student that graduate attributes are certainly a huge factor in what we would want to see as success. So it's the metric of the grad of the pass rate, but then of course the graduate attribute and all kinds of um, sensitivities and attitudes and understandings that we want our graduates to see. Um, and we need to think a bit more again about who defines it. That's our second question. So Jonathan, coming back to you, you spoke, for instance, about leadership and abilities and preparedness for leadership and um, you know some people may argue and say well we should really educate students to be meaningful participants active participants and cooperative participants not everybody can be in a leader and a leader is a hierarchical thinking so there's all kinds of thinking about what kinds of graduates then if we say graduate attributes are important not just the metric of the past rate but the, the graduate attribute who then defines this graduate attribute Uh, good question again. Um, so when I was a vice chancellor, um, uh, at, you know, I came into a university that had two major problems. The one problem is that at the lowest um, throughput rates, are, the second lowest throughput rates of all the public universities in South Africa. Um, so that was a problem. The second is that it had, as you might recall, the most egregious racist act uh, when four white students you know racially abused five black workers and i sat with my colleagues throughout the university and its three campuses and said what is important for us to do and we agreed that there was and we called it the academic project and the human project the academic project meant for us that we needed to dramatically raise the academic standard of this former white university in the middle of South Africa. Um, and, and that included the, the past rates of students, obviously, the standards for appointing prof professors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that academic project became a very important metric for us in determining not just student success, but academic success more broadly. And then secondly, we re uh, um, uh, you know, configured the entire university to make sure that black and white students could learn to live together, you know, without uh, harming each other. And I can assure you that is not an easy, an easy task. What does this mean? It means that for each institution, you have to define what success means in the context of your history, in the context of your geography, in the context of your you know, your, your, your particular political world. And let me just give you one example that might be more obvious to South Africans than perhaps to Elizabeth and Hans, but I don't know. Um, I'm at Stellenbosch University. It's probably the wealthiest university on the African continent at the moment. Um, it has doesn't have a problem with student success rates because they are able to, you know, select the cream of the crop, so to speak, both black and white middle class students by and large. And so that for me happens. That is not something that I would make an issue of as a leader in terms of success. But we have serious problems when it comes to success in transforming uh, the ways in which students think. Um, and, and I love the way Elizabeth put it, you know, changing the way people see the world. <laughs> that seems to me that 
having a 90% graduation rates, but students who become a danger to society without having addressed the ways in which they see the world. My point for now is that has to be an institutional set of decisions about what is important in the context in which you work. Now, this seems to me to be an ideal opportunity to bring together democratic conversations among the stakeholders of the university, the, the students, the, 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 the staff, the professors, to say, what do you think is important? What do you think should count? And especially among the students, because you as a professor might have a particular view of success that's quite narrow and, you know, uh, uh, professorial, if you will. <laughs> but a student might say, you know, as we heard recently in a commission of inquiry here, into racism at our university, as students felt that they didn't feel at home. They didn't feel they belonged. There's black students. They didn't feel that they were recognized. Now, it seems to me, in an institutional definition, that should count. Well, then this is lovely. Um, I would have some questions, and I want to ask you that just after Elizabeth answers. And um, the questions I would want to, okay, Elizabeth, you answer who defines that success? Well, and, I, and, yeah. I think that this is a, there, there is a plethora of uh, stakeholders that take part in this definition. Um, for I think that yes, internally at the university, we have the academics, the students, and the uh, employees, and all the staff that work inside the university, all these people take part in our in, in defining this, especially this, let's say, cultural change that it's very important. Uh, in Brazil, uh, I think that our experience is that the uh, student movement are very active in, in discussing these issues. Uh, I, 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 I was, I witnessed some very interesting changing experience by some students uh, in, that come to the university. They come with this, uh, this very traditional idea that, well, now I am in the best university in Brazil. I am going to get a very good degree and I'm going to the labor market and have success and this is the way I define success and then they start interacting interacting with many different collectives and movements inside the university and this opened their mind of the challenges not they are going to face not only at the society but inside the university this issue of belonging is very important it's something that we usually to take for granted in our universities. I think that because we have a quite homogeneous profile of students, and now that we are getting students with different backgrounds, different uh, social, economic, cultural backgrounds, uh, we have even indigenous people that don't speak Portuguese and come to the university, and we now are trying to uh, adapt our curricula to, to, to embrace these people, the, these new non-traditional students in our university. And this is a challenge for us. Uh, uh, because of the pandemic experience, my university create a provost for, uh, for, for receiving the students and supporting their stay at the university, because this is something very important for many students, especially for those that come from families that have no experience with uh, academic, uh, academic in the past, the, need, the, the university is a very, a very challenge for them they don't feel at home and this is something that it's up to us to embrace them and bring them inside to the university this is a this is the first step and well i think that it is also part uh it's the society that evaluates our degree of success in uh of our, the degree of success of our students. It is also the labor market because at the end of the day, what we provide to the students is also mm -hmm. skills and all the capabilities for 
perform well in the labor market, and this is very important. And I would like to, to call the attention of the many roles the university, especially mm -hmm. in developing countries in emerging markets like Brazil, like South Africa have, not only providing degrees for young students, but mm -hmm. also provide uh, learning opportunities for people that had no opportunity to attend a very good university. This is a very important, this is a role that we usually don't take care, don't, uh, don't uh, evaluate well, but it's very important. For, for instance, in my university, we have 87,000 students attending undergraduate and graduate students but also almost 100,000 of people passing through our uh, short programs, classes, training programs, and all different kinds of training alternatives that don't lead to a degree, but are very important for many people. Yeah. So this is, it is, I think it's very important. And for these students, the way we evaluate their success is different yeah. because they, they, they are usually adult people with family, but yeah. passing through the university open, has the potent potentiality to open their mind to different alternatives of learning and new at attitudes and things like that. Okay. And also, of course, yeah. The academics, <laughs> we are responsible yeah. for evaluating. Let's get that to the next, in the next question. Let me see from Hans. Hans, if we, um, if we say we, we decided on what success, well, we come back to that definition, but what, did you, what would you say, who defines that success? Who defines what is successful? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, there are several points that we have to take into account when we, asked, uh, when we answered that question. One is, Context is always related, so you you can make some general remarks, and we have done that in uh, in the previous uh, discussion. Uh, but context is so important that you can uh, you have to be avoiding to make it too general. Uh, let me say, I was working in, in Boston College, and so in Boston, and you have Harvard and MIT, and their definitions of what uh, is student success are quite different than uh, a Catholic Jesuit institution focused on social justice like Boston College, because they have a different perception of what the institution is, but also the type of students that come to Boston College are different than they go to Harvard or MIT. The mm -hmm. same as now I'm based in Amsterdam. Uh, there's a huge difference between a research university like the University of Amsterdam and the University of Applied Sciences in Amsterdam, because the students have a different career path, they have a different background, and so defining student success is always context related. That's also different between what is the context in South Africa and Brazil compared to the global north. Uh, it's different by discipline. Uh, in a, a student success from uh, uh, a, 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 a nursing school is quite different than from a business school, etc. So uh, you have to always look into uh, what is the context in which the student is there and what the aspirations are for the labor market for the students and how um, the institutions have to respond to those outside uh, society, industry, uh, mm -hmm. and inside students and academics uh, define their student success. Uh, so I think context is, is, is very uh, essential. Uh, I also think still that, and uh, in particular Elizabeth has also referred to that, but also Jonathan, is that we uh, we should use much more the students as a voice in this process. Uh, there is still a tendency to uh, to talk ab over, about students, but not with students about what they need and what their students' uh, success is. So they are an important player and we should use them. Uh, I've been uh, coming from the 60s movements in, in Europe where student participation became very essential. Uh, and have been myself very active as a student in all kinds of boards of uh, departments and faculties and the university, etc. And uh, I always hear from people that uh, the student voice is so much more driven by motivations, by ideas than those of administrators or academics. So we should use also in the Global South much more, I think, 
um, students as active participations in accreditation processes, in uh, reviewing and evaluations, in defining in departments what student success is. So um, I think society is important, industry is important, faculty are important, but students are very crucial in this whole process. So I hear you say that it's a stakeholder issue. Jonathan was emphasizing that the institution and the identity of the institution is important and owns their own um, um, successes or definition of it. Maybe you can I just extend that question. So is there something absolute about student success? Is there something that is always an absolute that will remain and then the context tweaks it and adds it and so forth and, and tailors it to itself? Do you wanna say something about the absolute aspects? Um, yeah, something that in your terms is negotiable. That is a non-negotiable. Jonathan, I'll start with you again. Sure. I mean, academic success, absolutely non-negotiable. You know, in a country like South Africa, where the social and individual rates of return to investment in education is the highest in the world, there are huge costs to individuals and to families uh, where you have, as in South Africa, very low pass rates and progression rates, et cetera. So, and there's huge wastage, uh, not wastage, but you know what I mean, huge yeah, inefficiencies yeah. in the system because we don't take our talent seriously. So um, given the brokenness of the school system, given the, for which, as I often say, the students are not your problem, uh, we have to find ways in which to make sure that those whom we admit either come in directly into degree programs or as we did when I was vice chancellor, we created a separate campus mm. so that you can take another year or two to be able to, you know, meet the standard for admission. And many thousands of those students went on to become professionals and so on and so forth. The point is, I don't know, of, I mean, all the other things matter less than making sure that a working class kid from, you know, with very little money, is able to become a first generation graduate in the university in South Africa, that surely has to be non-negotiable. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to respond in a minute. Um, Jonathan, I just wanna challenge you on a little bit and say, well, if um, it's of course getting a degree um, is not just a return on investment. And, and, and I'm hoping that even for that case that you described where the return on investment is so high because the working class going forward to being a tax paying citizen in South Africa, one hopes that there is a consciousness and attributes and a, a leadership ability in that degree that doesn't just equip the individual to have a degree and become a gainful employee after the degree. So having a degree is of course a non-negotiable, you're quite right, but coupled to that, surely are attributes and graduate attributes and qualities that we would want to see what Hans is describing as the SDG, awareness of SDGs. Elizabeth is describing awareness of, you know, being in a, in a pluralistic world. Um, I just want to check that with you, Jonathan. Yeah, I made that point. I made that concession already. Okay. That there should be at least those three things, including the, remember earlier, the issue yeah. of personal transformation and leadership prep, yeah. your ability to enter the world and change it. Uh, is a very, you know, I did recently a graduation speech at the German university and I simply looked for PhDs and I simply looked at the titles of the PhDs and I told the students what they were researching and all of the titles of the PhDs, believe it or not, had huge implications from climate change to immigration reform to, you know what I mean? So that's, those are situations in which the attributes you talk about are built into the education. Yeah. Of the graduate uh and and yeah i think we're on the same page yeah yeah no exactly i just wanted to highlight that that's just a lovely point how these two kind of things speak to each other um i want to go on to the next question and ask how will we know wh well what would it look like if in a few years you know martian comes down to the planet and say oh well you know that country has been successful with their higher education systems what would it look like what would success look like? What is your evidence of being successful? Or in fact, um, you know, where do we see huge evidence of, well, we, we do see huge evidence of not being successful, I know that, but how would you know? What's your indicator of evidence? Are you talking about the country or the or one institution? One um, individual institution, the country. 
<laughs> yeah, the country. Well, I think that at least in Latin America, I think we have a very uh, important trade in higher education that we need to fight, uh, which is the credentialism. Credentialism means that credentials are more important than the content of the education the student receive at the university. Uh, you know, for instance, in, in Brazil, almost one third of our students are enlisted and enrolled in uh, teacher education, but we have a very poor teacher teaching in Brazil. Almost half of our students reach uh, secondary education without, uh, without uh, learning uh, how to read, in fact, to read a paragraph that are uh, wider than three lines, which means we have a we we farm a lot of teachers, but these teachers don't know how to how to train the students, how to, to teach the students. And this comes from the fact that in Brazil, holding a degree of a teacher of pedagogy, it's a very important degree, but it's the degree that it's important not the content of the learning that come behind this degree. So for me, success in Brazil is to change this approach to higher education. And it means to short the bridge that divide a very well-funded public higher education, but very strict, very elitist, public higher education, despite the fact that we have half of our entrance positions for, uh, reserved for, for students from lower income uh, families. Uh, we have a highly uh, competitive and highly prestigious private sec uh, public sector and a very well profit oriented private sector. And we need to change this divide because otherwise we, we will always have some schools, some, well, it's not universities, but some kind non-university institutions that are supposed to be for the poor people, for the people less well qualified academically. And these very well regarded institutions that are for the people that are good people. And this, this for me is the main challenge in, in Brazil, at least. And I think that in many countries in, let's say these emerging countries in the global South, we have this problem. We have a totally segregate uh, system where some institutions are for the people that are qualified, either academically, either because they are rich enough to pay these institutions, and a lot, a, a huge systems of poor endowed and poor regarded, poor evaluated inside the, the society institutions that are really in charge of expanding access to higher education. But in this sense, expanding only expanding access to higher education through these institute, through these um, very low regarded institutions means almost nothing for the for the country and means that we are distributing degrees without the content of learning, uh, the proper learning that these degrees should uh, certify. Right. Hans, can I ask you about how will you know if somebody, if some institution, and the distinction is very nice here to say institution, uh, institution or, or country region has been successful, what's the evidence? Yeah, uh, the evidence is basically, uh, as, as also Jonathan and, uh, and Elizabeth said, is based on the quality of the content. And uh, what we see is that in the world now, uh, success from an institutional point of view is driven much more by uh, things like uh, terrible things like rankings, et cetera, uh, than by really the content of the quality that we're doing. And so it is defined by 
uh, external uh, indicators which are not based on the quality and the institution's vision and mission of things, but much more by uh, how can you compete uh, the whole competitive environment. So that, that's, I think, one of the, the sad things. Uh, at the same time, uh, from a student perspective, you also have to change their mentality because uh, when I was working in, uh, in, in the United States, uh, there was this whole issue that uh, great inflation as students want they were not interested in getting a good quality education but in getting high grades and that uh, would perform them well on the, on the success they would have in the labor market etc where in the country in, in the Netherlands we had the opposite students were not interested in high grades they were interested in completion and so getting a degree uh, we call that the six culture. You, you have a grade is from one to ten, and so if you have a six, you pass, and you were happy with that, uh, and you didn't care that you would do much better than that. Uh, so, for two different kind of perceptions of how you see career between American students and Dutch students are already illustrative of that. Mm. Because in the Dutch case, what happened? Students from Latin America, Africa, and Asia came as international students. And they were not like the Dutch just looking at uh, uh, getting a, a sixth grade, but they really wanted to have a high quality education because they needed it for their career perspective much more. So that then influenced the way students, Dutch students had to, uh, to take them because they certainly had to compete with other students uh, for doing well. So uh, these are all kind of complicated but fascinating process that we have to take into account. Uh, at the end, we have to convince both institutions society and students that not the grade and the degree is important, but the quality of the education to prepare them as professionals and as citizens for the world uh, to do well. That is, I think, the essence of what we have to do and to, uh, to change academia in that sense, going back to our traditional missions. That was exactly what we wanted to do, but we have forgotten about it because we are getting into a, too much of a competitive environment where we compete as uh, in rankings, etc. Yeah. Jonathan didn't get to give you a chance to answer that question. Do you want to reflect on and tell us? Yeah, sure. Answer? So, so, so I like the broader perspective that Elizabeth and Hunt spoke about. Uh, let me just uh, bring it back to perhaps the institutional perspective, just given what I, my, my, you know, my work, uh, I would, want to know as a vice chancellor um, whether I would measure the success of our programs, of our degrees, uh, based on simply on the students, what they say when they leave, where they go when they graduate, how they lead where they are, and how often they come back to contribute. Well, these are quite um interesting indicators um you could even measure that you could put a tool out and measure that that's a lovely tool to have um they we've had a question in the chat and i want to get to that in a minute um i wanted to um the the magic one question we'll get to um in a minute i wanted to ask about success about global awareness um you know, for me, the success would be that to be locally, I mean, we always speak about being locally active and having impact at local level, but also the global awareness, which of course we, you know, are so much more aware of over the last few years. Um, if that would be how you would measure that. Jonathan, I want to come back to your points, if you were to develop a tool. Yeah, um, as you probably know, we required uh, as a sort of fairly, you know, medium level resourced uh, uh, university, uh, we required when I was VC that every every first year student has some international experience, whether that's crossing the border into Botswana, or whether that is you know visiting universities in other parts of the world. We'd send them to Asia, Europe, North America, etc., as part of that broader experience. And the reason for doing that is because of how incredibly isolated South African students are from the rest of the world. I'm sure Hans would say the same of American students, for example, uh, and American society broadly, you know, there's so much exceptionalism in these two countries and the ways in which they think that um, it is part of transforming, part of Elizabeth's changing the way they see the world, means seeing the world. You know? 
<laughs> and we 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 worked very hard to raise the money. And I mean, it had huge. We've written books about this, by the way. They had huge effects on these young people. So absolutely, and in a country that at the moment is afflicted with an anti-African, believe it or not, I say this with great embarrassment as a citizen, with a, a xenophobia towards other African uh, citizens, it, it breaks my heart that, and one of the reasons is ignorance. One of the reasons is, and it's the same students who protest uh, under the banner of decolonization, but they respect the colonial borders drawn around us. I don't, I don't get it, you know. So that notion, I think, of, of a broader citizenship than one that is so nativist is the, the, the stuff that makes Donald Trump, the stuff that makes the Tory party in the UK. That stuff has to be part of an education that is broadly inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to, um, Hans Elizabeth, if you wanna add something, otherwise I'll go to a question. There was one question that was posted from the, from the larger, because we've got the audience in another room. The question was, if you were to, it goes back to our first and second um, point as to who defines it. Would you, when you said that stakeholders would define success, would you include industry and employers to be part of the definition or helping to define what is success? Yeah, anyway. I go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Well, for me, of course, yes. At the labor market, it's a very important uh, stakeholder of the learning process inside the university. At the end of the day, we prepare people to work in the real world. So uh, we have to have some insight, some clues coming from the industry, from the, well, from the labor market in general. And it's a very, uh, it seems that this is very important because uh, you know, there is a tradition in, especially inside the university culture that shun the participation, uh, real engagement from the, uh, from the labor market. We usually use it to, to think that we only form people to, for a more academic advanced uh, uh, world, world, a very, rarefate word, but no, that's not true because we are not, in the past, we are not the university that attend only 2% of the youth in each country. We are a very massive industry. We provide learning opportunities for people from different stages in their uh, in their life. So I think that it's very important to have the uh, the, the, the view from the labor market in general. And so you wanted to say something, I'll go back to Jonathan after that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important to say, well, how, how do we define that industry and the labor market? Has, sometimes then they invite big multinationals to, uh, to provide input, uh, but forget about local industries and small companies and uh, medium companies. Uh, I think most of the students in any context, uh, with the exception maybe of the uh, big world-class universities, are going to work in a local or national environment. So um, they have to understand. Uh, to you have to listen to the local industry and the national industry much more than the big companies in those contexts. Uh, they know what uh, they need. Uh, they also know uh, what they need from what we discussed before. And Jonathan responded to the global environment. So uh, we have an, an inclination to divide local and global as two different things, but they are connected. So if you go to a local uh, company to work, then still you have to work with clients uh, who are international and intercultural. You have to work with products that are international and intercultural. Uh, you have to communicate across borders, et cetera. So the local industry also needs what kind of skills in that sense of uh, global skills we need uh, and how can we uh, address that in the curriculum? Uh, so industry is important, but uh, look at the diversity of the industry as well, and look in particular to the local context as being important. Uh, that I think is very crucial. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, no, I love those comments by my colleagues, um, and and particularly Hans's caution. Um, look, I can't think that a university would address issues of success in professional fields, for example, like business school, social work. Uh, Are then you frozen? Yeah, I think so. Jonathan, you're back. I'm sure he's going to log back in. Jonathan, you've frozen for a minute there. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Jonathan would have an just very interesting thing to say about the relationship of degrees and how we prepare graduates for the world of work and what the expectations are from the world of work and whether that, you know, and how that kind of matches up and should it ever really match up. Of course, hearing the voice of industry is very important. Um, Cindy, I wonder if you can contact Jonathan and just tell him he's frozen up for us. Um, so I want to just ask you, um, Elizabeth and Hans, before we close off, I want to just quickly see if you were now to have a magic wand and the fairy would come and say, give me, you know, you have one wish. What is that one wish you want to higher education to make away with or make do with? What, what is the one thing you wished for? Well, I think that the main issue, at least for Latin American university, is to overcome this hierarchical design that we have in our countries. I think that this is very important. It's important for the people in general. It's important for the students. It's important for the society. Because as long as we go on on this trial where we have a a totally unconnected system where we have some institutions that are for the poor and institutions that are for the well endowed people. Uh, some of them coming from poor families, some of them coming from well, well being families. I think that this is a situation that higher education will always fail in their, in their missions for the society. We need to address this hierarchical design of our higher education. Here in Brazil, here I think in many countries in the global south, we have this problem. It's a hell of a um, complicated demand to make of that little fairy, but- um, Very complicated. <laughs> I'm going to go with that one. Hans, do you want to say quickly what your special wish is to that fairy? And Jonathan, I want to come back to your industry relationship and then give me your wish that if only a fairy would come. Well, I, I, I understand uh, Elizabeth's point of uh, getting uh, rid of the hierarchy because that's, uh, that creates a kind of much more competitive uh, uh, environment in higher education, which is not in the interest of quality, if not in the interest of student success uh, and not in the interest of society. At the same time, uh, we need also to, uh, to cherry the diversity in the higher education system. Not all institutions can be and should be world-class institutions. Uh, we need all kinds of different types of higher education institutions that relate to the labor market and relate to society in a different way. And uh, we have to respect that. We should not see them as second-class institutions, but indeed as very important players if they are local teaching institutions or working into uh, much more uh, continuing education programs. Uh, uh, I've seen very good examples of community colleges in the United States, which are doing an enormous important role in bringing in first generation and low income and rural students into higher education system and give them a career perspective, which is of interest to the local environment they are working in. So I would say let's um, get rid of hierarchy, but also at the same time, uh, recognize the importance of diversity also in relation to student success. You've just complicated the life of that little fairy. So not only must you get now, you know, get rid of this um, hierarchy, but you must preserve differentiation, what you're saying, the differentiation of the landscape. Um, yeah. Jonathan, do you want to say a little bit about that relationship with industry from earlier on and then give me your, your, your magic wish? Yeah. So, so first of all, my, my, my apologies. As you know, in South Africa, we have load shedding. So... As I was speaking, the lights, the electricity went off and it took a few minutes to reboot. 
Anyway, uh, I know the point I was making was that you have to listen to industry partners, using the word industry broadly to include the professions, um, but you got to listen critically because in certainly in South Africa, what, what schools will tell you is we want teachers who are competent in delivering on the stated curriculum. Well, that's fine. But if that's all they do, why have a university education? Because what a university education does is to both make you competent in the assigned curriculum, but to also prepare teachers to ask questions like, what else can we teach? What is missing? How, you know, because if the entire system is rigged towards, as it is at the moment, towards improving grade 12 or matric results, as we call it here, and the kids get seven distinctions when all they need is five or six subjects, then I want to know what is that an education uh, worth, worth having? So being able to prepare teachers, social workers, business uh, you know, students and so on for something more than simply delivering on the mandate of a company is why we have universities and not simply training schools. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very important part of that. My magic wand is if more and more institutions, even though the, 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 the funding uh, mechanisms don't uh, uh, you know, reward this is to broaden, to expand the metrics by which we measure success along the lines that Hans and Elizabeth uh, and I discussed today. And if it goes beyond simply those, um, you know, like a sense of a, 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 a global orientation towards the world, a sense of empathy, a sense of compassion to those who are less well off, a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, um, uh, you know, with our communities in the Sutu, Botswana, Zuma. you know, that broader sense of, of responsibility. I sort of don't want to use the word citizen in this context because we've we've mangled the word to mean something quite nativist. But but something broader than that, then I would be very, very happy because then a university, I think, uh, doesn't simply replicate what other institutions do, the home, the school, the church, the mosque, and the football club but it adds value to a changing society and indeed a changing world. Mm. I'd love to continue the conversation to hear all of your opinions on how the SDGs are now included in some of the ranking systems and how the we've got a new ranking system that just focuses on the SDGs and, uh, you know, and, and what that means um, and perhaps even what the implications of that will be if we could see into the future. I'd love to hear the opinions. But I do need to finish now. We said we'd finish at 10 past um, the hour because we want every to be able to log off and go into the next session. I want to thank all three of you for your lovely thoughts and your contributions and for um, answering the questions with such good examples and so it was so enriching for the audience. Um, thank you very, very much. I want to also thank um, Cindy Kai who's in the background and managing a big team. We can see three of the people on the team here. Um, a big team um, for each session and she's managing the conference. So. Um, so um, splendidly. Cindy, thank you also for being our moder um, moderator in the background. Thank you also for the participants who are listening in another room. Thank you very much for being here and joining us. We're closing the session now at 10 past the hour. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.